Hello, and welcome to Micrographia, an exploration of everyday items at the micro and nano scale. If you suffer from seasonal allergies and live in North America, the mere sight of a yellow field might send you into a full-fledged panic. Pollen from goldenrod, ragweed, and others can make life truly miserable. What do these sinus destroyers look like under a microscope? Well, as someone that suffers from allergies myself, I took the only prudent option. I waded into a field of goldenrod to collect a sample for study. You're welcome. Today, we are looking at the flowers and leaves of Soladego, the common goldenrod plant. Goldenrod is native to North America, but can also be found in parts of South America and Eurasia. These plants are a common wildflower seen in fields and along margins. Their prodigious growth and heavy set of flowers makes them an important source of nectar for pollinators. Honey derived from goldenrod fields is dark, and said to have a spicy note to it. Now, while researching this script, I learned a pretty shocking fact. Goldenrods do not, in fact, cause seasonal allergies. Goldenrods are pollinated by insects, bees, wasps, hornets, and the like, which means their pollen needs to be relatively heavy and sticky so that it adheres to the insect. If it was light enough to blow on the wind, it would be blown right off the pollinators. Because of this, goldenrod pollen has a very distinctive, spiky appearance. And while it can cause irritation if you inhale a face full of pollen, it is unlikely to be cast about on the wind for long distances. What this means is that a giant field of goldenrod is not actually spreading millions of pollen particles on the wind. It's actually a pretty sedate environment holding on to its sticky pollen until a bee rummages around the flower looking for nectar. So why do goldenrods get such a bad reputation? I myself have cursed fields of yellow more than a few times. Simply put, goldenrods bloom at the same time as ragweed, and it's ragweed that's the predominant source of airborne pollen in late summer. Unfortunately for goldenrods, they're vibrant yellow and spotted more easily than the dull green ragweeds, leading people to mistakenly assume that goldenrod is the culprit. There's some interesting landmarks to point out in the scanning electron micrographs. First are the visually striking stigmas. These are the female portions of the flower, which are responsible for transporting sperm to the ovary. When a pollen grain lands on a stigma, it will grow a pollen tube and attach to the stigma. The sperm cells inside of the pollen grain will migrate down the tube, through the stigma and the style, eventually fertilizing the ovary at the base of the flower. On a goldenrod, these take the form of a forked structure that have small finger-like cuticles. You can see pollen clinging to most of the stigma in these samples. The entire female portion of a flower is known as a pistil, and on the goldenrod, some pistils have an even more mm, fingery appendage on top of the stigma. This is known as the styler appendage. Frankly, I spent too long looking through my textbooks trying to determine the function of the structure with no apparent success. If someone knows, please share in the comments down below. I also struggled to find the male portion of the flower, the stamen, composed of the anther and the filament, which is where the pollen is produced. It's possible the set of flowers I collected were exclusively female, or past the point of producing male flowers. So instead, here's a representative micrograph that I found from the academic literature. Other structures that we see include flower petals, which remind me of an eel emerging from the depths of an ocean. These fine, filamenty structures scattered around are called pappus. These structures give rise to the white fluff on dandelions, but on goldenrods, they're just fine hair-like structures around the base of the flower. Now might be a good time to talk about artifacts in scanning electron micrographs. In many of the images seen today, there's a deflated or crumpled look to the various parts of the plant. While this might be an accurate depiction of some structures, like the backside of the petals, which as far as I can tell, really do look like this, other areas are definitely unintentional artifacts. These arise from how the sample is prepared for microscopy. You see, a scanning electron microscope operates in a vacuum. Samples have to be fully dehydrated before they can be placed into a vacuum, and are often coated with a thin layer of metal as well. 
Different preparation techniques preserve or distort different aspects of a sample. My method of choice, dehydration and fixation in methanol, followed by freeze drying and tert butanol, does an acceptable job, but it isn't perfect, as seen in some of the images. So it's always important to remember that some features may not look exactly like they do in real life, and this applies to scientific papers just as much as YouTube videos. If there's interest in the logistics of preparing samples for microscopy, perhaps we can do a future video on that subject. Turning our attention back to the goldenrod, let's take a look at the leaves. While not as varied as the structures of the flower, there are still some interesting landmarks. Here on the top of the leaf, we see the upper epidermis. Each blob is a single cell laid flat across the leaf, forming a protective barrier against the outside world. On the underside of the leaf, we also see these mouth-shaped structures known as stomata. These structures help regulate gas and water vapor exchange. During periods of high humidity and a lot of sunlight, the stomata are open. But at night, or if the plant needs to conserve moisture during a dry spell, the stomata will close. Each stomata is actually composed of two bean-shaped cells known as guard cells. They coordinate their behavior, swelling or shrinking, to open and close the pore. Running through the epidermis, we see veins. These carry water and nutrients from the roots up to the leaves and transport sugars from the leaves back down to the roots. Scattered around at intervals are small hairs called trichomes. Some trichomes secrete resins and substances which deter pests, while others help create a layer of stagnant air near the surface of the leaf to limit moisture loss. And some are just kind of pokey to irritate wayward insects and encourage them to go elsewhere. Finally, the best part about microscopy is that you often find unexpected surprises. Here is a ball of spaghetti. Well, it's more likely spider silk, which has caught a bunch of pollen instead of insects. I hope this has been an interesting look into the much maligned, but in reality quite harmless, wildflower known as goldenrod. I admit, when I started this video, I was ready to lambast the flowers, the root of all my sinus issues. But after research, I see that I was in fact mistaken, and it's just another beautiful and complex organism out in the wild which deserves our admiration. Perhaps someday we'll do a video on the true menace, ragweed, but I'm not sure my courage up to the task just quite yet. If you enjoyed this look at the microscopic world, please consider subscribing or sharing the video with a friend. If you have suggestions for future subjects to investigate, let me know in the comments down below. Plant biology is far from my expertise, and despite numerous papers and textbooks consulted, I'm sure mistakes were made. If you spotted any errors, please let me know and I'll compile an addendum. And as always, thanks for watching.